Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to The Sociology Show. This podcast is sponsored by Collins, high-quality student books, teacher guides, and unbeatable value revision for GCSE and A-level sociology. Now, Sociology Show listeners can get 25% off Collins Sociology resources until the end of December 2021. And that includes the new book, How to Be a Sociologist, an inspiring introduction to studying sociology at A-level and university. So if you would like to take up this offer, then please do visit collins.co.uk forward slash sociology show and enter the code sociology show at the checkout. Terms and conditions do apply, but that offer does run all the way through until December 2021. The Sociology Show podcast is also brought to you in association with Tutor to You Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so you can visit their website, which is tutortoyou.net forward slash sociology. And there you can pick up revision guides, flashcards, revision videos, and everything else that you need for your A-level or GCSE Sociology Studies. And so for this episode, I was delighted to be able to interview Dr. Ali Bose from Nottingham Trent University. So without further ado, let's listen to the interview. Hi, Ali. Thank you very much for joining me on the Sociology Show podcast. No, thanks for having me on, Matt. I'm looking forward to talking to you today. Great, great. Um, Shall we start with uh, an introduction, who you are and what you do, if you don't mind, Ali? Of course. So my name is Ali Bowes. I'm a senior lecturer in the sociology of sport at Nottingham Trent University. Um, so what I do is um, predominantly research elite women's sport. Um, so that's kind of my research area of specialty. Excellent. Thank you, Ali. And I've, I've, I've been asking a lot of people I've been interviewing recently how they ended up in the, the area of sociology that they do. So I'm guessing you're a keen sports person yourself. Um, I don't know what level or what sports you were involved in. Yeah, so I um, went to Loughborough Uni as a very keen sports science student um, and a pretty mediocre athlete, actually, but played a little bit of football and, and netball when I was at university and um, kind of fell into researching elite women's sports. So being at Loughborough, you're surrounded by international athletes and, and made friends with on my course, um, really good kind of female athletes. So my PhD project actually involved speaking to uh, women who had represented England in sport um, about kind of the concept of nationality and nationhood and national identity. And that's what started me into kind of working in this space around elite women's sport so that was my PhD research and then um, just kind of moved away from looking at nationalism and more into kind of this increasing professionalization that we see in women's sport at the top end and that's kind of where I sit now really. And just for clarification you you said you mentioned elite women's sport and um, sorry if this is a slightly pedantic question but what what counts as elite compared to amateur or professional what, what do we actually mean by elite? Good question. So it's probably a bit of a murky water when we think about women's sport, actually, because I think in men's sport, the distinction between amateur and professional marks out quite obviously what's elite and what's not elite to an extent. So in women's sport, we can talk about professional women's sport, but actually that only probably encompasses a very small percentage of what the top level of women's sport looks like. So elite women's sport, we are looking at kind of top Top leagues, um, so let's take netball, for example. If I was talking about elite netball, I'd be talking about the Netball Super League, which is the the premier league for netball in this country, of which not all of the athletes are are full-time professional or even semi-professional, and some are still fully amateur. So it really kind of depends on a sport-by-sport basis. But for how I look at, at women's sport and how I write about it, when we're talking elite, we are talking that kind of very top tier of women's sport 
of which we are we do see some as professionals and we see some as um semi-professionals and amateurs when when you're looking at elite women's sports is there a particular niche area that you look at in relation to it what specifically are you trying to identify in your research I think initially what started out or what started my interest in elite women's sport was I was kind of following and involved with um, professional women's golf initially. And that's obviously one end of the spectrum of this kind of elite women's sport environment. So um, opportunities to earn a a full time career, travel the world, etc. But still marked differences between the very elite kind of pro tours that women can play on. And the opportunities afforded to men at a similar level. Mm. So that's what kind of initially started me think, thinking about or wanting to look at some of the differences in access and opportunity and, and what those experiences might look like at, in a specific sport. And then that's kind of expanded more into um, almost... So I think when researchers talk about, or even when we anecdotally talk about women's sport, we very much use it as like a catch-all phrase, and it's referring to uh, girls in sport, women in sport at a a real amateur level, um, getting women back into sport, some of the issues around participation and involvement, all the way up to kind of the very elite end. And it was something I was quite conscious of, that we actually, as academics or or people writing about women's sport, we aren't making making any distinctions really between those different levels of women's sport and how women's sport is developing and growing and and some of those narratives around elite women's sport beyond really kind of media coverage so there's an extensive amount of work written on the media coverage of women's sport and what we mean by the media coverage of women's sport is obviously the media coverage of elite women's sport yeah and and we're starting to see increasing professional opportunities for women but they look very different to those professional opportunities that people often associate with elite level sport. And by sport in that sense, I mean men's sport, of course. And so it's very much around kind of starting to see how women's sports changing at the top end. What are these opportunities? Are there any problems in those opportunities for women of which, as we've kind of been researching me and and the the people I work with, um, have, have kind of pulled out quite a few kind of issues around the professionalization of women's sport as well as wanting to play a role in kind of documenting that growth and being part of the conversation about how women's sport is changing so before we get on to the 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 growth and the changes because obviously there's a lot of positive things going on if we go back to something you mentioned earlier something that i've always been interested in the the participation um it's it's well known in the uk for example that a lot of uh, girls start to lose interest in sports around the teenage years PE lessons, dropping out of teams and so on. Um, I I wanted to ask what what your thoughts were on that, Ali, why you think that that happens? Because I'm not sure that's necessarily the case in other countries, is it? Um, I mean, I think if you take information or data that's available to us regarding women and girls' involvement at like recreational level sport, Mm. you're probably not seeing too many differences across different contexts, give or take negligible amounts I think the narrative generally about women and girls involvement in sport is that it's um, on the decline or it it always looks less than men's involvement in sport and it might be different per sport per place so I think if you took soccer in the United States it's a different story to I don't know rugby in the UK for example so there are like kind of case-by-case differences but I think the general narrative around participation for women and girls in sport at a recreational level is always one of it being a problem um it's always less than or or um rooted in lots of issues so i guess if we take the uk context um and for context as well in a a sort of former life i was a PE teacher so i've kind of been seen firsthand some of those very real issues that Mm. teachers face as really they're they're kind of sold as these kind of problem solvers to all issues around physical activity, health and and sports participation. And actually it's a big ask of PE teachers to try and engage a huge diverse range of young people in a variety of activities and and promote kind of lifelong physical activity, sport, et cetera. So 
I mean, if I could answer the question, I could probably bottle it and, and sell it and make a lot of money, probably. So, um, I don't, like, I definitely don't have the answers. I don't think many people do. But um, I, I'm a firm believer in that what happens at the very top of sport and how sport is valued and prioritised by those in those extreme positions of power and how that is disseminated at the elite end, that sends some really important messages to women and girls yeah. at all levels about the value of their involvement in sport at any level. So that's kind of guided my interest or been one of the factors really in my interest at, at women's sport at this kind of elite end, because I think there can be very a very real impact if we can get things right at the elite end or equal things up or however we want to frame it that that can maybe kind of have a filter down effect around how women and girls are engaging in sport at, at kind of lower levels yeah it makes sense the kind of trickle down effect what we see at the top will affect at the lower end as well i mean it's it i i not to the same degree as you but I, i've taught a little bit of pe in my teaching career and uh, one of the things I really noticed was girls' participation when it was single sex compared to when the, they had to do uh, the, the lessons with the boys. And I don't know, you know, it, it could have been a confidence thing or sort of um, being aware of their bodies and changes and so on. But when I took single sex girl classes, they were a lot more engaged and willing to try things and try the high jump and, you know, throw themselves into things than they did when it was a mixed lesson. I don't know if that's a, a kind of common occurrence. I think it's there's a ton of PE research of which I'm not an expert in at all, but I have read kind of various bits around mixed sex PE at secondary school and single sex PE. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. So on the yeah. one hand, the separation PE is the only school subject that makes a separation by sex. Yeah. So what a way to mark out real obvious differences between what sport could be for boys and girls by separating them and telling them that they can't do it together. So on the one hand, it can, you can see kind of how it may contribute to perhaps, um, well, it's not maybe affecting participation and engagement in PE lessons at that current time, how it then starts to mark out some obvious differences between expectations of boys' bodies, girls' bodies, and what they are able to do. On the other hand, I think single sex PE has real value, especially as you get to teenage years. So away from year seven, eight, nine, age 11, 12, 13, into kind of 14, 15, 16, as, ha as being a space where girls can be physically active and not worry about all the things that teenagers worry about when it comes to wearing t-shirts and shorts in front of boys and, yeah. and doing activities and, and being out in the rain or, or whatever else. So it's an absolute minefield when you think about girls in, in PE and it's why, I mean, it's extensively researched and will continue to be because there is no kind of one fix all or one kind of right solution that's going to tackle some of these issues, I think. But um, yeah, it's a, a big, I think PE teachers got a big job on their hand because you've got some some girls who would absolutely thrive in a mixed sex PE environment who would love the competition and would love the, the challenge and, and the value that, that they then associate with PE. And then other girls who would shy away from that and thrive in a single sex environment. So I think it really is a, a diff, really difficult age for PE teachers to have to yeah. try and tackle. It, uh, it, it always reminds me of when I did PE at school myself, um, we had to do cross country running, you know, and the, the warm up when we used to come out, they used to say, right, girls run around the pitch once, boys three times, which yeah. you know, was offensive to both actually, because some of the guys were like, why do we have to do three? And, you know, to the girls to suggest they couldn't do it. And then, of course, we had the, um, the thing that if it was raining, the girls could stay inside in the sports hall whilst the boys still had to do it. And I was like, this, yeah, is, absolutely. this, isn't, very good. this isn't good for either sex telling them that that, that, that sort of instruction. Yeah, no. And then we see that in the tennis majors, women only play three sets, three yeah. sets and men play five. And, and it's all the same kind of rooted in the same ideas, isn't it? So, um, so let's move on to the, uh, 
to the elite elite bit then so is it fair to say ali i'm just talking from from my own perspective as someone that is a sports fan that the the changes in terms of representation in elite women's sports seems to have done more in the last five to ten years than at any point in history there seems to be of an explosion in terms of popularity finance going into it um representation and so on i'm not saying it's perfect of course but it there seems to be more sort of changes and developments in in a relatively short period of time than any time before um no I'd, i think that's fair to say to be honest matt i think um i'd maybe even be a little bit more extreme and say probably the last two or three years yeah. there's been a real growth and potentially since covid there's been kind of a i think i'm not empir- empirically informed but anecdotally there's been more investment and conscious kind of coverage and discussion of women's sport than I've seen for as long as I've been looking at at women's sport. Um, I don't want to kind of retell history books, but there are always these kind of boom moments in women's sport. People have have written about this narrative of um, this boom narrative that we see in women's sport that every year seems to be bigger and better than the last, Mm. and this is going to be the year for women's sport. And as you say, like we're, there's, we're nowhere near any form of parity or, Um, point of equality per se but there have always been these kind of successful moments and and transition periods I think in women's sport whether that's the first professional tennis tournament all the way up to the women's super league in 2011 turning professional in some regard all the way up to two billion people watching the women's world cup football final in 2019 so Yeah, I think it's fair to say that we're seeing definitely the last couple of years kind of some significant changes in the landscape of elite women's sport that um, are indicative of perhaps like um, some positive change, I think. Because one of the issues that I'm slightly concerned with, I'm interested to know your take on it, is that there's there's a a balance of is tokenism the right word? But, you know, for, for, for example, if you have a, a panel watching a football match and you have the pundits on it, um, that often they say, oh, you know, a female's thro- been thrown in just purely for tokenism, just to tick a box exercise. Um, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because we want better representation, but it can't feel sort of forced or just just there to kind of tick a box, if that makes sense, Ali. I'm not sure if that question really... No, that, it does make complete sense. sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, it does, definitely. I think that notion of tokenism, I think, is really important. I think it's something that has often been felt in women's sport, whether that's around football pundits being offered opportunities to commentate and the perception of football fans or, or the general public on what that invitation symbolises. Is it tokenistic? Is it based on value or attributes or whatever? But I, don't, I think it goes further than that. So it's almost like, are clubs tokenistically introducing women's teams because they feel like they have to because they're perhaps the only men's team that don't have a women's team. I think lots of those kind of discussions were had when Manchester United relaunched a women's team or we've seen recently in women's rugby like an increasing number of kind of men's pro rugby teams starting to get involved in the women's game. So I think the way in which organizations sports organizations whether that's teams governing bodies approach the inclusion of women has to be um cognizant of not appearing tokenistic um that and i I talk about value quite a lot i think we've talked about it already today but how they are valuing and positioning that team like speaks volumes um and it, it can be very obvious when it's a tokenistic move or not and i think Maybe a few years ago, we were seeing this idea, like box ticking idea that we need to keep people happy. So we do need to have a woman, a woman representative, or we do need to have a woman fan group or a a woman's team or girls academy or whatever that might look like. Whereas now I think there's a more, it feels like there's a more sincere investment in the women's side. And that comes from not only having a women's team, but giving them access to um, appropriate facilities or proper training times or giving them contracts. That means they can actually pay rent on their houses and and those kind of things. So I think, yeah, there's a fine line between kind of tokenism um, and 
yeah, real value. Um, and I think sometimes some organisations and clubs might be the wrong side of that, but yeah. Because it's one of the things that I've, I'm quite interested in. I'm a big football fan, so my team... Brighton um, has a successful women's team who are get, getting better and better, actually. And there's always that kind of discussion about should the two teams kind of be aligned? In other words, they wear the, they, they wear the same kit, etc. Or should there be a specialist kit for each team to make a distinction? I, I find that quite interesting. You know, so are, are we all part of one of the same banner? You know, the men's team, the women's team, the dis- disability team, the youth team, yeah. or should they have their own identity, their own kit, their own look, uh, their own ground? You know, that, that that's quite interesting, isn't it? In terms of what's the right, um, what's the right placement to adopt? Absolutely. I think it's a really difficult question. It's something that football clubs, I think, and the women's football community and people sort of interested in women's football and men's football, it's something that's been grappled with a lot. I think there are some historic, really significant historic women's teams that through a lack of association with like an elite men's club have faded into insignificance. And that's a real shame. There's like yeah. a lot of history and, and tradition and growth of the women's game kind of rooted in, in teams. One of the obvious ones of recent years is Doncaster over Bells, but you, you see it over time. And, and then you see teams like, I'll, I'll stick with Manchester United because we've already talked about them, but the Manchester United women's team come in and straight away, they get put into the second tier of women's football and, and they have the pull of the Manchester United badge and, players wanting to play for a club such as Manchester United and straight away they're kind of signing excellent players and 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 last season at points they were challenging for the the Women's Super League trophy in, in something like their fifth year of existence so on the one hand it feels almost as if the the rate in which especially a sport like football but we are seeing it in rugby as well um, for sure the rate in which those sports are growing and developing that if a women's if the women's team isn't closely aligned with the men's team, then they're going to struggle because we're moving into sport as business and away from kind of, I guess, sport as sport, if you, if you want to be simplistic about it. And for a woman's team to survive and be successful, which is fundamentally what fans want and what I guess fans of women's sport more broadly want to see on the successful teams, then that requires that has required a, a real lean on the, the support of the men's team and women's team teams that haven't been closely associated with the men's team have really struggled. So there's like a business arm to it. I think from a fan perspective, the, the there's the idea that if the club looks one and the same, that you, they've got a ready-made fan base yeah, and that it's an easy transition for for the hundreds of thousands of fans of a men's team like Man City to then start supporting the women's team. The women, the Man City women play at one of the academy stadiums, but it's been written about, Gary James writes a lot about Man City women and the history of the club and that transition of the men's fans into the women's game. That's been been talked about as being a real benefit. Perhaps not always a good thing to, you know, the Women's Super League was often sold as this, rightly or wrongly, um, a family-friendly, yeah. safe yeah. environment to go and watch football. And then all of a sudden we've got kind of the alignment with the men's team starts to bring in some of the fans of the men's game, which are perhaps not um, aligned with maybe that vision of this family-friendly game that perhaps the FA initially wanted to sell. Now, of course, that notion itself has been critiqued um, an academic at Sheffield Hallam, Beth Field in Lloyd, has written about that with Donna Woodhouse and the the issues of how the Women's Super League is framed. If we frame it as a family-friendly, kid-orientated environment, again, what value is that placing on the sport or is it being seen as the kind of baby version of the real thing? So that notion of the clubs being aligned, I've gone around the houses here, sorry, Matt, but... No, no, it's good. I think it's... Like it's a really complex matter because there are pros and cons of both sides, and the the kind of I imagine that the diehard women's football fans um, are horrified at the the way in which a big club can swoop in, set up a women's team, and all of a sudden be at the top of the women's super league, signing you know world cup winners in 
in Tobin Heath, for example. But on the other hand, like what a pull for the sport to be able to bring in World Cup winners and have a, the, one of the most recognisable football brands on TV playing in, in Manchester Derby. So it's a, yeah, a, a catch-22, I guess, in, in some yeah. regard. I suppose there's a parallel with the men, men's game there, isn't there? You know, Manchester City have come into money, Newcastle are about to come into money, and uh, the same happens in those those teams as well, doesn't it? That they can suddenly attract these world-class players at uh, ridiculous wages. So I, I suppose it does reflect what's happening there as well. Yes, no, definitely it does. Whether that's a good thing or not, yeah, remains to be seen, I guess. Do we want the women's game looking like the men's game? Maybe not, but... Lots of contested ideas, I think, around yeah. how, how women's football and how women's sport should grow, perhaps. And, and the next question I was going to ask is, just, despite what we've just said about the, the kind of boom in elite women's sports, the, the, the question that's always raised is about, um, you know, the, the pay, for example, that there, there yeah. is nowhere near sort of parity in terms of pay. And you're saying that some women who are elite sports women are still not actually able to go full time as such, you know, that it's still kind of a, a, a part time job um, alongside their main work as well. So. Where, where do we go to get even a little bit closer to, to men's elite sports? Um, yeah, there are the, the pay debate in women's sport in the comparison to men's sport is one that is definitely discussed in kind of popular discourse a lot um, and invoked tons of um, opinions for and against, I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah. I think... Yeah, the real challenge is, is like looking at, almost looking at it from like a, a zoomed out perspective and thinking, okay, what, like, why are, why are we in this scenario? What are the implications of this scenario? And, w- and what could make that scenario better, I guess. So one of the, the biggest points of contention from, let's say, your average sport fan who doesn't think women's sport should be paid the same as men's sport because it's, quote, not as good. So the... The issue that I guess is raised is that, okay, so how can the level of women's sport be better or improve? A, when we consider that the history of women's sport is much, especially elite women's sport or top level women's sport is much shorter in most team sports than the history of men's sport, significantly shorter. So they're working off like a really small, small period of growth, I guess. And then we're also talking about athletes who are navigating either being full-time students or full-time work or part-time work to an extent, fitting in, you know, training in and around those commitments, lack of rest, poor poor nutrition, lack of sports science support, and all those things that we think about when we think of elite sport environments in the men's game that makes men, that is all those marginal gains that men are seeking to get better and better that often a lot of women in elite settings, let's say Premier 15s Rugby, Women's Netball Super League, they're like scrabbling around to try and gather up all those marginal gains in whatever way they can, whilst also juggling kind of full-time work or or full-time education often. So once there's a recognition of the environment in which women are trying to operate, that helps to negate some of those discussions where it's like, why should we invest in women's sport because it doesn't look as good or it's not as quick or it's not as competitive in some regards. It's almost like, well, of course it isn't because look at the start point. Someone is going to have to invest somewhere so that these women have a fighting chance of maybe living like an elite athlete. And then that environment that they then live in is going to transfer into how they perform on the pitch. So that's a kind of logical path, I guess, to thinking about some of those equal pay debates. In some sports, I'm talking about the sports where we are seeing at the top level women still as amateurs or or very much semi-professionals. And it's never going to be this big wholesale change because it it requires businesses, sports organisations, clubs, etc. to put hands deep into pockets and, and invest into the women's game with the risk of not making that money back in sponsorship or not making that money back in terms of fan kind of fan numbers, et cetera. But there has to be 
it's like the perennial chicken and egg, isn't it? Like yeah. there has to be give somewhere. Um, and if we aren't giving women an opportunity to go and perform the best that they can, well, we can't really expect to see some of those improvements on the pitch. But then I guess at, at the other end of that, kind of the equal pay debate discussion is women operating at the top of their sport that are already playing professional. The most obvious example of that is the US Women's National Soccer Team. Yeah. Um, and we, in probably, I've just written about this with Alex Colvin and Sarah Carrick, and, and we've talked about kind of equal pay debates in football specifically. And there is an emerging kind of discussion at international level that international organizations are starting to pay women and men the same for international representation. So the English FA have done it. Um, Australia are, are in the process of doing it. The Netherlands are doing it. Some of the first ones, Finland. So we are seeing increasing, I think Ireland actually have just announced that they're going to do it. So increasing opportunity at international level, which is, of course, the best of the very best in that country. So it is only affecting kind of a small pool of women, I guess. But that is start, organisations are starting to pay equally for the men and women for representing the country on the international stage. And again, it's a, a, a question of value, isn't it? So if we're seeing an organisation at the very top, rule makers, uh, organisations that run competitions saying what we're deciding that what men and women do is the same which fundamentally is if they're being paid to do it as a job kind of aligns with you know legal requirements to do things like this yes um then hopefully the the challenge for that is transitioning that out of the international space into club football where the leagues operate separately so they can't sit there and say it's the same job because they've got different employers and, and various things so yeah, again, I mean, I feel like all the answers to my que all your questions are, are very much it depends or it's kind of really context specific. But I think there's been some significant moves in international football, which can have the potential to be significant in sport more broadly, I think. But yeah. it's, it can't be one big wholesale change. And also, do we want to see women footballers on the wages that men footballers get? Or actually, is there is some of the money being thrown around men's football actually hugely problematic um, and, and unsustainable, as we've seen with perhaps Barcelona and, and selling Messi and, and the various issues there. Like, where does the, where's the line on what becomes ridiculous? But there are big gaps in some leagues, um, but some real positive examples in international football that you can draw upon. And I'm, I'm confident that the US women's national team there, will, there has been positive ground and that they will eventually kind of be successful in, in achieving what they want to achieve, I think. Because the, the argument that always gets fired back, it's about, it's about money in versus money out, isn't it? So you yeah. know, if you took, for example, Chelsea football team, you know, uh, a home men's attendance is around 40,000 with people paying somewhere between 30 and 50 pound a ticket. And then if the women's team play on a Sunday and they're attracting, let's say, two and a half thousand at 10 pound a ticket, is it, you know, it, I know this is rather naive just to say it, but is it just about simple economics? No, it's, a, it's the obvious, it's the obvious comeback, isn't it? It yeah. is a, an, a really simple economic argument that makes a whole lot of logical sense. And I think the, again, the flag on that is a recognition of, okay, what, how long did it take Chelsea men's football to get to a point where yes. they could sell out Stamford Bridge at £50 a ticket. What yes. was the investment? What was the trajectory? What was the path? What was what did it look like in the 60s, 70s, etc. for it to become like this? And I think that's the challenge, isn't it? When it feels really obvious to me to say, well, of course, Chelsea women are not selling out Stamford Bridge for £50 a ticket because last year we could buy a ticket for £5 or... Chelsea women have been fully professional since the 2018-2019 season and it's only 2021. Yes. Like, so for me, it feels really logical to be like, it can't be an in-out question because where has the investment been that we've seen in the men's game or the time or the processes of development or the, the TV money? 
And again, like the, another argument comes in is like, why would organizations sponsor women's sport? Because not many people, like not enough people watch it on TV. But women's football or any women's sport is competing with, let's say we've seen live televised sports since the 1960s. It's competing with 60 years of embedded institutionalized sport TV watching and broadcasting that has only ever focused on men's sport that has built up huge global audiences that are used to sport on TV being men's sport. And now it's trying to like squeeze women's sport into this oversaturated market of, of sport where you can sit and watch sport all day, every day if you want. And it's always men's sport. So of course we don't have the history and, and, you know, lifelong sport fans because they're already 60 years into supporting a team they could watch on TV, you know, every weekend for the past however long Sky have had the Premier League. So it's, yeah, it's like challenging some of, challenging the economic argument with some of those arguments around, well, how, how do people understand and consume sport? How have they consumed sport for such a long time? what is our kind of historical involvement in sport and often it's one that centers on men's sport and men's sport being sport and then women's sport being this kind of new thing that's trying to squeeze in and and make a space for itself and it's going to be I guess a long process I think of of transition because the the question I've seen proposed which would be really interesting is you know uh, I wonder how far we are away from a, a woman going into the men's game. I was thinking particularly there's been discussions about Emma Hayes, the Chelsea manager. Yeah. You know, but could she move into the men's game? Many people would say, yeah, you know, absolutely, without a doubt. Now, were Emma Hayes to take up a, a Premier League job, would she be paid, I think the average Premier League manager gets five million a year? You know, would she be paid at that level? That would, I think that would make quite interesting reading, wouldn't it, to see what would happen in that, that sort of scenario. Oh, definitely. I think, um, I mean, Emma Hayes, um, I absolutely love Emma Hayes, by the way. So I've listened to a few podcasts (laughs) with her. I think she's fantastic. And she speaks very openly. And some of the the narrative around when she was rumoured to be in the running for the Wimbledon job. Yes. I think she really kind of hammered home some of the ideas that I guess fans of women's sport are really trying to put across that why would she take the Wimbledon job when she is managing one of the best women's teams in the world, competing for Champions League, in a Champions League final, you know, managing players who go to the World Cup, etc. Now, the question of Emma Hayes in the Premier League, yeah, I mean, she more than has the CV for it if we're saying, does she know how to coach yes. football? Does she know how to manage a football team? You, you could look at that and say, of course she does you know, whether she would go in and, and command those kind of wages. I mean, if that's the average wage of a Premier League coach, then why shouldn't she? And if she didn't, it would be purely because she's a woman and because you're not taking, you might say, oh, she's unproven in the Premier League. Well, how many managers come over to the Premier League unproven in the yes. Premier League? And we're not talking about, oh, are they going to get paid enough to go and play there? So, yeah, it's almost about, thinking of football as football and not thinking about which I think Emma Hayes tried to get across in terms of I already manage a fantastic team why would I come and manage Wimbledon she was talking about football in football terms and not about football in terms of men's football is the pinnacle of the sport and I just deal with women's football which is the secondary other um so yeah I think we are gonna see there's there's all the rumors about Hope Powell there are more and more women involved in the game in the men's game for sure um and more women involved coaching in the women's game as well that's historically been you know space that has been dominated by men and there there will be a day where a woman coaches a, a, a men's team in the UK and It'll be very interesting, I think, to see how that plays out in a variety of ways, whether that's fans, whether that's media, etc. Yeah, I think it would be, it would be fascinating. I don't want anyone snatching Hope Powell from Brighton, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can keep her under wraps. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, thank you, Ali. Uh, did, did you want to say a little bit more about, um, you know, if people wanted to find out more about your work, and I know your, your book, um, if people fine. want to find out a little bit more about that, the work and research that you've done? Cool, yes. So um, 
you can find I share a lot of my work on my Twitter page which is Dr Ali Bose on Twitter but um, we just published myself and a colleague of mine Dr Alex Colvin have just published a book an edited book called The Professionalization of Women's Sport Issues and Debates and some of the key ideas in that book are really some of the stuff we've talked about today so we're really lucky we we got a kind of a real international um, range of contributors and the, the premise of the book was very much around this kind of shift into a sport as work for women and, and how that's played out over time and we've got um, a chapter for example about tennis and obviously tennis has been professional for a very long time um, circa Billie Jean King era and Rob Lake from um, well, he's a British academic working in Canada. Rob Lake talks about the kind of his, he's a, a sports historian. He talks about the the change of, of tennis um, into a professional sport. And then we got a contribution about the growth of South African women's rugby. There's a couple on professional basketball. So um, one on pay and there's some really useful um, economical or economic arguments rather around pay so that would align with some of the stuff we talked about today we've got contribution on women's ice hockey in Canada or North America um something on golf media coverage of women's American football um a case study on Serena Williams and then a couple of examples of women's sport um that are really emerging as professional spaces so professional road cycling and national rugby league in Australia and we just try and pull together those kind of all those disparate stories, I guess, about how women's sports changing, growing, professionalizing into a coherent kind of discussion about actually there are some really gender specific issues in professionalizing women's sport, whether that's around employment conditions, maternity issues around maternity or injury whether that's investment into the sport, whether that's issues in how the sport's grown, because, for example, ten tennis had to make a, a you know a splinter splinter league, which we all are well informed on. So we just try and pull together some of these discussions, and and as I said earlier, there's not really been a space where people have coherently talked about this very top level of women's sport as elite or as emerging professional but we are really seeing it now in in lots of contexts so we just tried to, myself and Alex tried to pull together some of those arguments into into the book brilliant and where can, where can people uh, either purchase that or find out more about it um so you can purchase it from I believe most book places um but yeah, it that, is we can say Amazon can we are you, oh, okay. you can get it off Amazon <laughs> yeah um and you can get it from directly from it's published by Emerald Publishing. So you can get it directly from the Emerald website. And there is a 30 percent discount code um, of which it's completely slipped my mind. But it is on my Twitter. There is a 30 percent off code. Um, so you can purchase it from there. And then, yeah, we just kind of share share information and share publications via kind of social media and, and stuff. So if people follow follow along, then they'll have access to all, all the kind of research I'm involved with is around this kind of this aspect of women's sport. So brilliant. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today, Ali. I really appreciate it. Sorry, it was a bit football heavy. It's just, uh, you know, that was my sport. Is uh, I hope, I hope know, that was okay. <laughs> That's great. No, it's good, to, good to talk to you, Matt. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Lovely. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Thanks a lot. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show.